Thanks for coming, everyone. I'm Adam Cuello, and I'm really excited to be hosting Ashanti Branch today. Uh, Ashanti is a lot of things. He's the founder and executive director of the Ever Forward Club, which you'll learn about today. He's also an education fellow at the Stanford D School, and uh, he's also uh, assistant principal at Montera Middle School in the East Bay. And so today, Ashanti is going to take us through the taking off the mass exercise. So I hope you're all ready to get really real with your coworkers, because uh, it's going to get real in here. And, um, and then we're going to learn a little bit about how the Ever Forward Club is helping uh, young men in the East Bay and beyond. And you'll hear from some of the students that have benefited directly from it. So with that, I'd love to welcome Ashanti Branch. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So Adam probably made you a little nervous when he's like, Did you, are you ready to get real with your coworkers? <laughs> right? And I think that when we talk about getting real, sometimes that's a, a very, it means different things to different people. So we're not going to start there. I'm going to start by getting really real with you about me. So um, I'm more nervous than usual because um, my mom's in the room. <laughs> and. Um, like, she's never heard me present before. I don't know if she ever watched me present, but I know she's never been to one of my talks, at least my new talk. And I talk a lot about her. So this morning I was like, oh, man, how do I change that talk? So uh, what am I gonna, uh, how, how do I not say all the stuff I say? Um, and I had to call her yesterday for help. I had to call her yesterday for help. As an adult man, I had to call her because I didn't have enough drivers to get all the young men here. And so I had to ask her for help yesterday. And she said, OK. And so I said, well, why would I change the talk to try and not talk about her when the reason I'm standing here alive, free, educated, is because of her, of her sacrifice? You see, my father died three months before I was born. His father died three months before he died. So six months leading up to my birth, I lost both my grandfather and my father. And no one gave me a choice in the matter. Like, I just showed up here on the earth, out to Bates Hospital, popped out, and there was problems. Like, if you had handed me a checklist in the womb and I had a choice, I would have chosen things that looked pretty different. Like, I would have chosen to have two parents, to maybe live in a house, to maybe live in a community where being smart was okay. Where, like, being your best wasn't, like, making other people feel bad, but being your best was absolutely, people were pushing you to be better than your best. But I didn't, I didn't get that either. So growing up in Oakland, California, I knew that there were certain ways I had to behave and act that would get me either respect or not. Like, there was a very short list of what it meant to be a man, a boy, growing into be a man. But at a, in, in Oakland, where I grew up, like, when you're a boy, you have to be a man. Like, they're telling you, man up. Be tough. Don't show no emotions. Can you imagine, like, the, my first day of fourth grade, um, showing up at a new school, like, excited to be in this new school in the hills. Like, it was, it was incredible. Like, there was no apartments around there. There was, like, all houses. It was, it was beautiful. Like I had a fight my first day of fourth grade, right? Because the guy was like, we're playing tag, right? Fourth graders play tag, right? We're playing tag. He tags me. I said, OK, I'm it. You should be running. But he tags me again. I said, why do you, why do you keep tagging me? I'm, I'm already it. I tag, he tags me again. And I realize he's not tagging me. He's hitting me. Now, I also know certain rules at fourth grade. I already know that if I let this keep happening, this is in a moment of like a couple of seconds. I'm processing. If I let this keep happening, everybody at this new school is going to think they could be hitting me. I don't want to fight. I don't really like to fight. So, but in that moment, I knew that something had to happen. I could either take it and then be a victim the rest of these years in elementary school, or I could do something about it. If you're not the kind of person who really likes fighting, that's a hard decision. Like I was raised by my mother. Like she taught me to be really nice. But nice doesn't work so well in the playground for a young black boy growing up in Oakland. Being kind and being gentle doesn't really help you be looked at as a 
as, as somebody who people were like, man, he's incredible. It actually makes you look weak, soft. They call you many names that would fit in the soft, weak category. They're usually not very positive. And so I was so thankful um, that throughout elementary, you were only in a class with maybe 25 people. So being smart is kind of OK. You can kind of be smart with those 25 people. Not too many people bother you. But when you get to middle school, it's a whole other world because you got 180 kids you got to deal with, six classes, you got to be in PE, you got to be in and out of classes, you got to like shift, shift your behavior so many times a day. And I learned that smart wasn't cool. So even though I, maybe in my back of my mind thought I was smart, that was not what I was showing. Now, for me, math was easy, so I could do math. We play a lot of math games in my house, so math was easy. So I was passing math without a problem. But English, didn't really like English. Didn't really like science, history, didn't really like anything else. Didn't really like PE. So I just did barely enough so that my mom wouldn't trip, right? So C minus, I could kind of talk my way out of it. I can't come home with no Ds, right? Every once in a while, I would fall into the D range and couldn't climb out. And that would be like a half hour lecture about something. I didn't really remember much of it. But I want you to know that middle school, I was in trouble. Like, if you saw me in middle school, if you, like, walked on my middle school campus and saw me, you would never have said, this guy's going to be speaking to companies one day. <laughs> You'd be like, they're going to study <laughs> what this guy's doing one day. Because my behavior was definitely not leading me to, towards being educated in any way. And so m my life began to get really chaotic in middle school. Like middle school was that place where you now are beginning to be tested. Like your body's growing, your mind is like saying, hey, I want to do this. But people around you say you can't do that. And so you're beginning to like try to figure out your world around you. Like getting bullied, like having somebody take your lunch money, like that was happening. Like I couldn't tell my mom about it. Like how do you go, how, first of all, how do I do it in myself that I let somebody hap, let that happen? That I was afraid enough to let somebody take my money and I gave it to them. That was really tough to deal with. So I kept it to myself. And I think that the only way she figured it out is because every time I come home after school, I was super hungry. And we already, there was already not enough, a lot of things in the refrigerator anyway. So she would know when stuff was missing because I, I was eating lunch and breakfast at the same time, kind of. And it wasn't until like, that moment where I was like, this can't happen anymore. Another moment in my life, being in seventh grade, where you're like, okay, I got to stop this from happening. But what if you're afraid? What if the people who are pushing on you, making you do something you don't want to do, but you're afraid to like stand against them? What do you do? Well, it becomes a very scary day to have to be like, I'm actually really afraid, but I'm actually going to have to face this fear because if it doesn't stop now, it's going to keep going. And so it wasn't until uh, middle school, in the, around the eighth grade, moving into ninth grade, where a teacher really pulled me aside. Like, she said, you know, you're really smart, but you're not, you don't act like you're not. She said, I, I know that you're upset that your father died before you were born. I know that you're upset about that. Maybe you're sad about that. I'm like, I ain't sad. When she said I was upset, I was cool with being upset. Because you, you can be upset as a young man in Oakland. But don't be talking about me being sad. But I think deep down, I was really sad. When I would see kids get dropped off by their fathers or get picked up by their fathers or get chastised by their fathers, I was like, I, I want that. And it wasn't until she said to me, you know, life doesn't give you what you want. Life gives you what you get. And you have to make the most out of it. And in that half hour lecture she was giving me at that moment, that's the only sentence I remember. But it absolutely changed my life. And so uh, I get my act together, I go to high school, I'm going to go to college. I hear there's a program called Upward Bound. OK, they help you get to college, first generation college students. I'm like, excellent. Turn my application. The lady calls me into the office and said, hey. I said, all right, where, where do I start? She was like, well, I have some bad news. Said, what do you mean bad news? I want to go to college. You help people get to college. She's like, well, you're not first generation college student. I was like, of course I am. Nobody went to college in my family. Like, your mom went to college. Your mom's a teacher. 
I'm like, we don't make no money? Like, don't you go to college to make money? Why are we broke? And I knew that day I would never be a teacher. I was clear that I would never, ever be a teacher. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to college, I ain't going to be no teacher, because teachers don't make money, and we, make, we got teachers in my, ha- my house. As much as I love my mom. So I went home that day pretty upset with her. Like, you mean we, got, we went to college, and we just barely able to make it? It was awakening for me. So I knew that I was good at math. Science was starting getting better for me. When I started paying attention, I'm going to be an engineer. Graduate high school, go to college, civil engineering. Start working, making money. Great. Working, making money. I could pay rent and PG&E the same month and still have money for food. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. But why am I not happy? Like, how in the world am I able to, like, poor boy from Oakland, goes to college, becomes an engineer, making money, and I'm not happy? And they told me that was what the secret to happiness was. You make a lot of money, you can go do fun things, never miss a bachelor party. You go everywhere when you have money. But I'm not happy. And what happened to me in the next year or two was uh, not planned. By, definitely not my plan. So let me tell you the story really quick, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to go real fast. I was tutoring at this learning center. One day a kid walked in. He couldn't multiply polynomials. I love multiplying polynomials. He looked at me. He said, can you really help me? I'm like, dude, I got this. He comes. He sits down. I help him. The light turns on out of like, almost like he turns a book, and he sees the answer, and he looks at me, and he's like, oh, my gosh. It's that easy? I'm like, yes. And I felt it. I felt this thing that I had never felt before, and I was like, oh, no, no, no. That's teaching thing. <laughs> we, oh, we, we not doing that. So I told the lady at the front desk who hired me, I said, listen, um, I'm not working here no more. <laughs> right? Because you, 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 right? If, if you're telling me that this teaching thing feels that good, and I actually enjoy it, then I got to run from it because that doesn't make money. And I've already been clear in my mind that I would never be a teacher. So I took off. I said, well, I'll still help with the, until the end of this SAT season, and then don't call me. But it was already in me. The seed was planted. It was growing really fast, and I was trying to run from it. So I move on. I make more money, and it starts getting worse. And so then I said, well, look, I can always go back to be an engineer. I'm going to go do this teaching thing for a little while. And then I can always go be an engineer. I got my degree on the wall, so they, they can't take that, right? So I become a teacher. And that was 2002. I haven't looked back. Well, I've looked back. I've, I've only looked at the salaries, right? I, looked at, I haven't looked back at saying that I'm going to be going back. And so my first year teaching, coming out of heart, heart calling me to do this work, um, I'm failing. Like, I signed up for a low salary. I just signed up for being broke and a failure. I wasn't going to have both. So I was like, look, I'm going to go back to this to work to make a money thing if I don't figure this out. So I invited some students to lunch. And I said, look, I'll buy you all lunch once a week, a group of young men, uh, if you teach me how to be a better teacher. Like, tell me what I'm doing wrong, because like, I'll fix it. If there's something I can fix and why you're not passing my class and the fact that I'm here for you 100%, the fact that I'm here early, I stay late, I'll provide food for you. There's always snacks in my room. Like, what do you need me to do to help you pass this class? Because I knew that algebra wasn't just algebra. Algebra was the gatekeeper. Because no algebra, no high school graduation. That's how California works. You you don't get through high school if you don't pass algebra. So therefore, I knew that I could see four years down the line ahead of them. Like, okay, you don't pass this. This This is bad news down the line. And many of them couldn't see that for themselves. And so the Everforward Club started out of that, these lunchtime meetings where I began to hear them say, it's not cool to be smart here. I ain't going to be no nerd, no geek, no teacher's pet. I'm not carrying no heavy backpack. All the things I remember thinking and saying when I was in middle school. And I knew that my job was never going to be, oh, I'm going to tell you that it's okay to be smart, and you're going to believe me. Have you, anybody have teenagers? Have you ever tried to tell a teenager something that you know is right, and they are convinced that it's not right? They'll wear you out. They have way more energy than us. And so I knew that my job was not to tell them that, yes, smart is cool. You can be smart. It'll pay off later because it's not paying off right now. 
The payoff at the lunch line isn't this, this smartness ain't paying off there. It's not paying off at PE. It ain't paying off at getting to school. It ain't paying off on the bus. If they can't see the payout, why would they invest the time and energy? So we began to work around the system. And that's how the Ever Forward Club was created. It, I was not trying to start a nonprofit. I was already, I had already decided to be a teacher. Why would I be in some nonprofit kind of thing? <laughs> like that just seems totally double, uh, running the opposite direction of what I had worked so hard for, I thought. So I was like, we're going to figure this thing out. And so what I'm going to have you do right now is I'm going to have you hear from some of the young men that are in our program uh, who have been in the program either for a long time or up to just a couple of months. And they're all just going to tell you one or two sentences about themselves, about what school they're at. Um, some of them are really nervous right now. Like when there was like one or two people in here, they were like, oh, I got this. And when people start filling in, they start getting a little nervous. So just um, smile at them a little bit. And um, so they're all going to come up. You're going to come at the same time. All of you come up. Everybody else, you'll come up. And so please introduce yourself. You on that side? All right. My name is Nate, and I'm a student at San Lorenzo High. I became a part of the Ever Forward Club because I thought this would be a wonderful experience for me. This club has done many things for me, including focusing more on school and raising my grades. My name is Deshaun Smith. I'm 16 years old. I go to San Lorenzo High School. Um, I've been part of this program for a year and a half. Uh, I joined the program because I saw my friends, you know, honestly, you know, they was having fun. It was like, join it. So I hopped in, and um, it, it taught me a lot. It, it made me become a, a better, mature young man, educated, uh, get me through tough times, you know, and I appreciate what this program has done for me. My name is Daniel Williams. I go to Edendale Middle School. I started this program two years ago. I like this program because it's a good program. It also helps us become educated and strong men. The reason why I joined the Ever Forward Club is because I thought I should try it out, and it turned out great, so that's why I stayed in this club, and it helped me graduate middle school. Hi, my name is Devin Williams, and I go to Edendale Middle School, and I've been in the Ever Forward Club for two years. I joined this club because I wanted to be su successful in life, and Branch taught me to be mature and help me go through bad things. Uh, hi, my name is Javier Sandoval. I am a junior at Arise High School. I've been an EFC member for about six months now. Uh, I joined to have a safe environment to share about problems that I was going through back then. Uh, I found out that everyone goes through struggles even if we don't normally talk about them. Um, my name is Ambrosio Pablo, and um, I just graduate, graduated from Arise High School. And um, in around September, I'm going to start college at Berkeley. And um, so I, I joined Ever Forward when, uh, my freshman year. And throughout these years, like, you know, I've been given a lot of opportunities by him, provided by him and by the Ever Forward. And I feel like if I hadn't, you know, if I hadn't joined the Ever Forward, I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I had. And throughout, also throughout the years, like, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff. And, you know, um, he's also, like, always on my back, you know. And, um, yeah, but, like, I mean, it's, 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 like, helpful to me because sometimes I've just, like, fallen back on stuff. And, like, you know, I'm just like, oh, man, like. Like, let me just give this a break, you know? But then, like, he always calls me up, and he's like, oh, have you done this? Have you, like, you, or, or, like uh, uh, just stuff like that, you know? He just tells me, have you done this? Like, always on my back, but, like, you know, sometimes I get annoyed, but, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful, you know, straight up. <laughs> so, Ambrosio, come here. Ambrosio, Ambrosio is, um, so he's going to be starting at Cal. Um, and um, so Ambrosio actually is going to be on a, a full ride to Cal. So I'm really proud of him and all his hard work. Um, and so, so I wanted you to be able to hear from them. And I think that if you stayed afterwards and asked them more questions, I, I tried to get them not to read it. I was like, don't read it. Like, just, like you wrote it, so you know it. So just let it come through you. 
And they were like, no, I got to have this thing. <laughs> so we're in a technology place, so you all get it, right? The technology for them, right? And so I let it, I let it be. Um, and so when the Everfora Club began to grow, um, and we ended up back at my alma mater, Fremont High School, there was a lot of chaos going on. And there's still a lot of chaos going on at Fremont High School. And I was thinking, well, how could I try and be of service? I was like the dean that year. And I was like, well, I'm dealing with all these referrals. And I keep seeing a lot of our young men just getting sent out, kicked out. And I didn't have the, I didn't have the vision that I was going to be running a club there. I was like, well, I'm here to do this job. And then there was a need. There was a need. And uh, the documentary, The Mask You Live In, uh, has anybody seen the documentary, The Mask You Live In? A few of you. Um, so uh, the Representation Project, um, which is their founder is Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Uh, her first film back in 2011 was called Misrepresentation, M-I-S-S. And it was about the underrepresentation, the misrepresentation of women um, around the nation, around sports, media, music, like just all different areas. Um, in 2015, um, released at Sundance was The Mask You Live In, and it was about American masculinity and the challenges our boys and young, fa young men face in a society where they're being told that this is the limited list of what it means to be a man. Very limited list, a very, very small box of things that you can show that shows you're masculine and you're, you're a man. And so when they asked us to come film at um, Fremont High School, I said, well, I, I'm working with a group of young men. They're kind of, what they call this thing the brotherhood, but they're, they're not really telling the truth often. You know, like when we check in, they all say well, they're, they're a 10. From a 1 to 10, like, well, I'm a 10. All of them are 10s. I'm like, now I know as a dean, they're not all 10s. Right? Like, I'm like, you my man. You got, you got four referrals today. How are you a 10? And I know that you're dealing with this and you're dealing with that, but as a, my job as a mentor is not to tell their stuff to the circle. It's a whole space. Even if I'm letting them sometimes not really always tell the truth. And so I said, well, you can come, but just so you know that it's not really r real. It's kind, of, it's kind of fake. And they were like, well, at least we get to see they're resisting the opportunity to let go of some stuff. And I was like, OK, OK, no problem, because I was really excited they were coming. But in my mind, I was like, you're not about to be filming me with a group of young men lying. <laughs> like, you know, that's not going to happen. So I was trying to figure out how do I get them to talk about it in a way that was disconnected from them a little bit. It was a little bit um, out of. Um, out of their direct way of having to say, I'm dealing with this. And so what you're going to experience right now is what was created that, for that day. And if you see the documentary, uh, you'll see a little bit of that in the documentary. I mean, it's, it's now available on uh, Netflix and iTunes. And uh, we'll hopefully be doing Google some Play movies. I'm sorry? Google Play movies. Google Play movies? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, see, see what happens? I told them I was going to mess up. I told them I was going to mess up. And Google Play Movies. That's right. How dare you. So now, I was already sweating as it was. OK, OK. Reset. I need some water. I need some water. I need some water. OK. okay. Got me. I got you. I got you. I got you. And on Google Play Movies. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so right now in your seat, or probably you already put it on the floor, you have a, a blank piece of paper. And you have a pen, a marker. So please grab that marker, the piece of paper. And so we know we have people that are um, viewing from other places. And so you, if you have a piece of paper handy or you have a journal there, you can actually participate as well. So it's just a regular blank paper. And so you can participate wherever you are watching as well. Um, and so when we started with the blank paper, my first question to anyone in the room is, what do you think or what do you find, um, what do you believe is a purpose of a mask? What is the purpose of a mask? Yes. To hide something. Transform. To fit in. To, fit in. to put out a fake facade. To put out a fake facade. Safety. Safety. Who's safety? safety. Project something about yourself. Project something about yourself. Those are excellent answers. Um, what I would like you to do is, and, and I know some of you are sitting with friends, and so do your best to just kind of focus on your own paper. Like, do your best not to look to the left or right. I want you to just come from whatever's in your mind, and I want you on this paper to draw a mask. Like, whatever you think a mask looks like is right. 
Just draw a mask. Okay, so um, now you can turn it over just so you don't, people don't be trying to look at your mask right now. Um, well, I want you to think about is this mask as being a representation of you? Right? I'm not saying it looks like you. I'm just saying it is like a representation of you, right? It came from your mind to your pen to your paper, and you drew it. So just think of it as a representation of you. And so what I would like you to do is I'd like you on the front of the mask to think of three characteristics that you gladly let the world see about you. Like when you leave the house and you go out into the world, well, what are those three characteristics that you would say, I show the world that I'm this, I'm these three things? Three characteristics or phrases that you represent that you let people see. There's no talking. Thank you. And please write those on the front. And once you finish those on the front, then turn your paper over. So now, if the front of the mask represent a representation of you are the three things you show the world, what do you think I'm going to ask you to write on the back? Was my laugh? Like, say what is it? Things you hide. Maybe, maybe. It, it, may, it may be things you hide, but it may just be things you just don't talk about. Maybe things that you just leave unsaid, like no one brings it up. I don't bring it up. It doesn't exist. Maybe just things you just leave to. That people can just guess if they want, but I don't really talk much about that. So I'd like you to write whatever, up to your level of comfort, three things that you just don't show the world, you just don't talk about on the back. Three words or phrases, those three things on the back, please. And when you finish, I want you just to ball the paper up. And since if you're in the side room, if you're in a satellite place, you can just... You may not want to throw it at people in the room because they're probably right in front of you. But um, in this room, we're going to do something. So once you've balled it up, I want you to stand up. You need your hands free. Have you stand up. And what I'm going to have you do is, um, how about we have the first three, the first th two rows, first two rows, first three, yeah, first two rows, stand up. And on this side. And I want you all to kind of face this way. Oh, everyone's going to stand, but I'm going to have you all face this way. Have you all face that way. And what I need you to do is I'm going to have you close your eyes. And you're like, What's, what is happening here? It's, OK, trust me. Uh, well, do your best to trust me if you can. Um, I want you to imagine that this piece of paper in your hand is turning into snow. Like, it's, like you feel it? Can you feel the snow? Yeah, it's like a snowball right now. And what I want you to do is, except for the people who are right in the middle, I don't want you to hit the person right in front of you. I want you to hit someone with this snowball on the opposite side of the room. But you got to keep your eyes closed. I don't want you to aim at anybody. I just want you to just throw it, and it will hit somebody, maybe. Now, um, this is supposed to be fun. So if you are kind of the person right now who's not feeling like fun, you're not in a fun mood, I would say you cannot, throw, you cannot do it. But I want you to throw, at least throw your mask and just throw it to the air, and it will, it will, it will work out. It always works out. So I'm gonna have you close your eyes. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say three, two, one. Wait, now don't do it yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna say, then I'm gonna say it. I'm going to say three, two, one, snow throw. And when I say snow throw, you just throw them. It's gonna be incredible. It's gonna be incredible. Just watch. It's be incredible. So here we go. Okay, close your eyes. Here we go. Three, two, one, snow throw. Now you can open your eyes. Now you should find one. You should find one. Everyone should just find one. But don't open it. Don't open it. You should find one. If you don't have one, we'll pass one. You need one? You got one? There's one right there by that bag right there. Can I have that bag right there? Awesome. Thank you. Everyone has one? Who needs them? Who's missing one? I got an extra one. You missing one? Everybody got one? Everybody got one? Awesome. We good? we good? Okay. So you can have a seat. Now, now take it. I want you. I want you right now to take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Young men. Thank you. Take a deep breath. 
Okay, now, here, here's where it gets a little tricky, okay? So, so um, sometimes in this activity, in this workshop, so we've done this workshop uh, this last school year with about 5,000 people. Um, parents, teachers, young men, young women in schools. And so people bring us into their uh, teams to do this workshop. This is just the first part. Um, and what we found in the beginning, the reason I'm having to tell you this disclaimer before you can open it is because sometimes people are opening it looking for something. And I want you to know that you're not really looking for anything. Like, like this is the gift you've been given. Because one, one of my mentors said, um, showing up is about 90% of success. Now, you may have heard 98, 95. Some percentage of success is a high percentage of just showing up. So whatever you have, if somebody showed up today, I'm really thankful you all showed up. But they showed up and they said, well, even if I don't write anything, I'm going to participate a little bit by balling this paper up and I'm throwing it at somebody. So you're not looking for something inside. So if it's blank, it's supposed to be blank. Like if it's illegible and you can't read it, it's supposed to be illegible so you can't read it. Like anything inside is just extra to the gift. For somebody just showing up and say, hey, I'm going to just give a little bit of myself in this space. So what I'd like you to do carefully, respectfully, is to open the paper, but don't talk about it to your neighbor. Don't talk about it to your neighbor. So what I need is I need some volunteers, and then we gotta move. I gotta move quickly. So I need maybe five volunteers who would be willing to read one of the words from the front of the mask. So, so I'll let, well, I'll have you help, and then yes, sir, you there, you, and you, right on this side. You want to Okay, and then I, okay, please start. Read the word on the from one word from the front. Happy. Thank you. We pass it. Poised. Smart. Nice. Male. Curious. Poised, smart, curious. Confidence. Confidence. Energetic. Energetic. Hold, hold, hold it right there. Hold it right there. You're going to hold it. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Like, those qualities, do you recognize those working here? For those that work here, like you recognize this quality? Smart, energetic, poised, hardworking. There's a few males here, right? Like those are the qualities that we show. So hopefully you recognize them. I've been to a workshop where people read the one word from the front, and I said, do you all recognize those qualities here? And people were like, uh, I was like, well, you all wrote them. <laughs> you, all, you all said that's what you show. Do you know that it's possible for some people not to see what you think you're showing? Now this part gets a little harder, a little trickier. And it may have been tricky when you had to, when you were asked to write it. Maybe you, like, when you, maybe your stomach was churning, maybe your brain was spinning, maybe the connection between your heart and your head was like in a battle, like don't do it, do it, don't do it, do it. But whatever happened on the, when you wrote the back may have been brought you to a certain different place. And you'll experience it again right now, maybe. So please turn the paper over. And can I have a few volunteers to read the words that are on the back? Now, if you're in the overflow, maybe in, the, in the one of the side rooms, maybe you can just read your own and just listen to what we are gonna, you're going to hear happening here in this space. So um, yeah, as you, as you see it, just look for a hand in the pass it, OK? So this um, is from the back. Personal stuff. Fear. Sad stories. Personal family relationships. Tears. Insecurity. Fear of failure. Imposter. Unqualified. Struggles. Watch YouTube. Respectful. Stress. Childhood. Lack of family connections. Can you take a breath? Take a deep breath? Yeah. So what are you, what's happening? What do you notice? What's happening in your head, in your body, in your heart? What are you noticing? Empathy. Can you say like another sentence about empathy? Being able to feel um, what a room is feeling like anonymously. We're probably all closer onto the negative side than we think. 
I feel more connected to other people as opposed to connected to myself only. Like, I feel like I'm not the only one feeling certain, some of those things. So no matter where I go to do this workshop, whether I'm at a, a middle school on 98th Avenue in deep East Oakland, whether I'm at a private school in San Francisco, whether I'm working with some parents at a parenting workshop, whether I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, whether I'm in Seattle, Washington, what I experience, what I've observed, is that so often people don't realize how much we're dealing with some of the same stuff. As an educator, you know that you have to show up in class, believe the junk in the car, go up in front of the students, be on the show, and then when you get back in the car, you can pick it back up on the way home. And I imagine maybe some of you have to do the same. And the question is like, do you, do you just like tell everybody everything? Like when they say, how you doing? You say, well, let me tell you what's how I'm doing. Let me, thank you for asking. I've been waiting for somebody to ask me all day. <laughs> Most times when people say, how you doing? They're already like three feet away by the time you answer. Because oftentimes we don't really mean how you doing. We just have gotten comfortable with how you doing being just a way to say, I'm, I'm really kind of noticing you. <laughs> have you ever experienced it? Like think about it, somebody asks you how you're doing, like see if they're, if they're, they're, are they actually caring how you're doing or is it just our way of greeting each other? Try it next time. Like somebody says, how you doing? Say, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you. <laughs> and watch them. <laughs> watch, watch their face. Just be like, what's your... <laughs> Try it. Try it today. It happened in the afternoon. How you doing? Like, so glad you asked. You have to sit down for some coffee. And what I believe is that because we are human, we say it because it's what we've been taught that we just, it's kindness, it's a, it's a greeting. But how do we deal with the real stuff? When we're in a high performance environment, when we're in a, a high stress environment like middle school and high school, how do we deal with the real stuff when we can't really deal with it there? I wish that Ever Forward Club didn't have to exist. When I started teaching, I was barely learning the teaching thing. Like I wasn't trying to start anything on the side, but it, the teaching wasn't reaching them because they were dealing with trying to pretend that the baggage wasn't real, that they were like showing up to school, super g silly, happy, whatever they were doing, but they had, a, they had a harder filter. Their filter was harder, so it was kind of leaking out into their day-to-day -day action. As, old, as adults, we have more practice. We know, hey, I'm not showing none of that. I go and get myself ready. Like none of that happened last night. That didn't happen. That didn't really just happen this morning on my way to work. It didn't happen. I didn't just get that text at lunchtime. It didn't happen. Let me just get back to work. And so what I've learned and what we have learned in Ever Forward is that providing these young men a safe space to talk about what's really going on in a safe space. Like, I don't expect them to be able to talk about that stuff out there. Not yet. Our society's not ready for young men to be totally into their emotions. They can be in anger. Anger will get you respect. You can be super funny and silly. That'll get you some, some points. But you can't be sad. You can't be afraid. And so what I've experienced in working with adults and working with parents is that if you don't find a place, it may not be at work, but if you don't find a place that you can go regularly to be like, let me just talk about what's really going on, not to be fixed, but just to be heard, just to be seen, I believe that we do ourselves a disservice. If you're a manager and you're working with people and you got people in your team who may not be doing everything the way they should or whatever, like, maybe, maybe you could ask, hey, how's it going? Like, can we just have a... A real talk? So when Adam said get real, getting real is like, can I talk about what's really going on and feel safe that it's not going to jeopardize my, 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 my evaluation or my, my status among my team? Like it wasn't until um, I joined a men's team um, in 2010 that I really began that I felt like I was being seen by other men that were pushing me to be better 
Like, I could talk about successes at work, and people were not like, oh, whatever. You know, like, like it was like, yeah, nice. That's powerful. It's powerful to be knowing that you could have people around you who care about you being the best you. So they help you through the down times. Because the only way to move back up is to get through the down times. We're all going to have them. But if we're always pretending like everything's always perfect, then when do we ever get support to get stronger, to get better? And so if you don't have that, I, I mean, I would encourage you to find that. You know, in the Bay Area here, there's plenty of organizations, men's teams, women's teams, or organizations that support all different, um, different groups that you would like feel a company or feel um, like you want to connect to. What does that feel like to be able to talk about what's really going on and know that it's not going to get back to people that's gonna, that could make decisions about your life? Say, so, you know, I'm, I'm really sad. I'm really dealing with some sadness. I have an extreme fear of failure. I have extreme fear of police. Like, I'll see one walk into Starbucks and my heart will start pounding. Like, like pounding, like, like I want to leave. And so where do I go talk about that? Well, who, who do I tell that I'm feeling this anxiety every time I see some flashing lights because I'm like, I have a big mouth and I, I sometimes I talk, I talk a lot. So I talk back, <laughs> right? And so I'm like, okay, I better not say nothing back. I better say yes, sir, no, sir. Like, I feel like I got to do that to keep my life. Sometimes. Who do I talk about to that? Some people can't understand it. And so I'm so glad that you all came today. And I think that one of the things that you have on your seat is you have ways that you could get involved. Like you could support the young people in your community. Like right now, our program is in its growing phase. Like the Stanford D School Fellowship has really helped me to be able to tell what we're doing in a better way, clearer using design thinking, starting with empathy, starting with the human-centered design. Like, am I designing, am I creating a program for them? Am I asking them what is it that they need so that we make sure that the program exists to support them? And so we have a Google Serve Day that um, Adam is helping us put together. All the information is on that paper. You can sign up to volunteer with us. You can just be in touch with us. You can just send information out to people about what we're doing. You can participate in that. You can, um, you can also donate. I'm not asking you to leave your job to go do this work. Like, I, I've, I made that sacrifice. And so if you feel inclined that if it calls your heart to support us in a financial way, we, encur we, we would encourage you to do that, too. Maybe there's something else, some other calls out there that's really calling your heart and you've been kind of like ignoring it. Maybe you could begin putting some attention to that. So I'm really um, super thankful for this time. And I wanted to leave a few minutes. We only have like maybe five or seven minutes left. So whether if there were any questions for the young men, uh, for myself, um, but I thank you for being here and I thank you for participating. Um, the mass that you have, we will collect. Um, we are envisioning what, what what the data looks like as we travel all over doing this workshop. So we will collect these. So if you can just leave them on the seat if you leave, or you can pass them forward. But if there's any questions, um, we'll take some questions. And if they can be aimed at myself, Ambrosio back there, or any of the young men here, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming out here. Appreciate uh, you sharing your story, taking off your mask for us. Thank you. Um, and appreciate all the great work that you're doing with these young men over there as well. Uh, question is, uh, are you doing any work with men in the South Bay area or Peninsula? And if so, just want to hear a little bit more about that yes, and how so to get involved in that. Thank you. So this year, we have been doing workshops all over the Bay Area um, and being invited to other states to do workshops. So we have a chapter that's at Jordan Middle School, which is in Palo Alto. And we have been invited to JLS, which is, um, uh, I don't, I don't want to say what the JLS stands for, but there's another middle school that we went to a screening for the documentary. And so there's a, a teachers there who want us to do some work with some young men there. 
We go into schools and we do the taking off the mask workshop. It's usually about a two hour workshop. And so that's our first level of engagement with the students. And once that workshop happens, they'll know, the administrators will know whether the young people are connected. Like they, they're ready to get real, right? Because the work is, we don't, we, you gotta like help them understand that it's a reason that we're not getting real because we're not allowed to. And so um, there's a school in San Jose that uh, just been, so I'm reaching out. So if you know schools, if you know principals, if you know, um, if you know a school that we should reach out to, uh, we, our goal next year, so this academic school year, 16, 17, our goal is to um, take 10,000 people through our workshop. This past year was 5,000, and so we're gonna be building the team of facilitators that go out. And so um, we're ready, you know, we're, we're, in, we're, in that, we're in that stage of like, um, what is the distribution model of how we get our work out to the, to the bigger part of the world? And we're, you know, we're raising money right now to, um, you know, I took a leave of absence to take the Stanford Fellowship, um, so that's one year off. So I'm purposely not looking for a job right now because th this is what I should be doing. And it's also scary. Like, it, it, it's scary to go from a high salary to low. It's even scarier to go from a little bit of salary to none. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I feel it. But I'm also knowing that, that that's, the, that's why I do it, and, um, and it's going to happen. Yeah, thank you for asking. Hello. Have you done talks outside of the state of California? Uh, yeah, we got invited to um, Minnesota, um, in the Minneapolis area, uh, and I did a screening, and we did a talk there. I was on uh, Minnesota Public Radio. Um, last, I'm going to be in Texas in this summer, so we're doing a lot more. So right now, is like as we begin to reach out, um, but yeah, we do talks wherever if anybody wants us to come. So how do we get in contact? I'd be very interested for you to come to Atlanta, Georgia, for a talk. Fantastic. Yeah, I, man, I'll, let's, you have my information on that card, but when we, before we, when we end, I'll give you my information. And I would love to do that. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. So, Shante, thank you for coming. This was super educational. I knew nothing about the program. I'm super pumped. Um, I want to thank these young gentlemen who got up there. It took a lot of courage to do that. And I know you're saying they were on their iPhones. Like, I was a really shy kid growing up. We didn't have iPhones. <laughs> I, had a, I, had a, I had a piece of paper where I was told to memorize it. And, and I thought you guys did a really great job articulating yourselves and articulating the program. So I just wanted to thank you for participating in that. I think it was super cool. So yeah, thank thank you so much. We we saw him at Wisdom 2.0, and one of the few standing ovations of three days of just heartfelt presentations. Um, so I actually wanted to thank your mom for doing such a great job. And uh, the uh, I guess for those of us that might be parents, be parents down the road. How did how did you do such a good job? And I just <laughs> it took a lot of prayer. <laughs> Ashanti really was a good kid. He really was. I think only one time his temper got the better of him, and that was in elementary school. And I think he turned over a desk. He was so upset. But I think that's the only time where I can ever remember um, having to go to the school to deal with a lot of discipline with Ashanti. He was really a good big brother. He was really a good first son. Does he have his moments? Yes, but we all do. So that's why I had to keep praying for him and the rest of my children. <laughs> and, um, and just, you know, it's, it, life is life, you know? You, with, with children, you have to let them know, I love you, you know? And, but one thing he knew, when the teachers told me he did something, I said, I'm believing the teachers. You know, I believe you, but I'm believing the teachers. But he knew that um, I had his back on things, but he knew that I expected a uh, high of him. I remember one year uh, when he was getting ready to graduate, Ashanti uh, said, well, I've decided I'm not going to college. I said, oh yeah, you're not going to college? Nope, I've decided I'm not going to college. I said, okay, well, just get ready, because you need to find a job. 
So that means that everything you will be paying for yourself, your food, your clothes, and everything since you feel you're not going to college. And I think he was playing a game with me because he went to college and won a bunch of scholarships. <laughs> but, but I had to let him know that's your decision. So we have to just support our children. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot she's not telling you. Like, what is, I'm just going to say, like, I'm going to let that one go. Um, yeah, thank you, Mama. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and thank you, Ashanti, for sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.